Good afternoon. I'm Don Griffin, and I'm District Governor of 6270. Uh, I extend my um, uh, gratitude to, to each one of you for joining us this, after, this afternoon um, as we delve into this significant topic. Uh, the um, road revision statement is uh, together we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. And currently, you've, you've reunited, you united with 34 other individuals today, and we expect many more. 34 members of, or 34, 35. 45% of the members of our clubs are represented, and we will also be accompanied by 16 members of Rotary from outside of the district, as well as 18 individuals who are not members of Rotary. So welcome everybody. At Rotary, we understand the paramount importance of nurturing a diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment to realize our vision of a world where you individuals unite and collaborate to create a lasting change. We hold diversity in high regard and pay homage to the contributions of individuals from various walks of life, including age, ethnicity, race, color, disability, learning style, religion, faith, socioeconomic status, culture, marital status, language focus, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, as well as differences in ideas, thoughts, and values, and beliefs. Recognizing the historical barriers faced by certain groups in terms of membership, participation, and leadership, we pledge to advocate equity across all dimensions of Rotary, including our community engagement to ensure that every individual has a fair access to resources, opportunities, networks, and the support necessary for them to flourish. We firmly believe that each individual possesses both visible and invisible attributes which uniquely identify them. As we strive to foster inclusive cultures where everyone feels valued and embraced, resulting in a sense of belonging. To uphold this principle, Rotary adopted its DEI statement in 2019. District 270 established a task force uh, which has resolved in a standing committee. Starting in 2020, this group has hosted events such as this one we are attending today. Many of them are accessible through our YouTube channel playlist at youtube.com slash at RID6270. Again, that is uh, youtube.com at uh, slash at RID 6270. So in addition to welcoming to you this event, I will be serving as your Zoom operator with Nitraj assisting me in monitoring the chat for your questions and comments. At this Good juncture, on. I would like to uh, pass the baton to Len. I knew I was going to do this. Asquinta, your host and moderator, who is a current member of the Rotary District 6270 Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee. Len? Thank you, Don. It's with great pleasure that I introduce Deanna Singh. She's a true powerhouse in the realm of social change. Deanna's impact resonates far and wide, reaching over 100,000 individuals annually. She's an esteemed speaker, award-winning author, educator, and business leader. I've read her most recent books and attended her workshop, and this one, the topic of today, is Dynamite, the best ever. Deanna has also authored six impactful books. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Urban Studies from Fordham University, a Juris Doctorate from Georgetown University, and a Master's in Business Administration from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has been recognized by the Milwaukee Business Journal as one of the community's most influential 40 under 40 leaders, and also as a woman of inspiration. She was identified by the state of Wisconsin as a woman who inspires, and by Forbes as an African-American woman everyone should know. 
It's an honor to have Diana with us today to share her insights and wisdom on actions speak louder, everyone matters for success. Remember during this workshop, if you have questions for your, our speaker, please enter them in the chat. Our community member colleague, Natraj Shankar, will be monitoring and they will be presented to the speaker towards the end. Welcome, Diana. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be here with the Rotary. And I have to say, I feel like I'm with you all everywhere I go because I get the opportunity to travel all over the world. And all I have to do is look to my right or look to my left and I find an amazing Rotary member, uh, somebody who is doing exceptional work in the world. And so the opportunity to join you, the opportunity to be able to spend some time with you, to learn alongside you is really a great honor. So thank you so much to the committee for the invitation. Thank you to all of you who are here making some time this afternoon uh, to have this conversation. I know that there are so many things that are demanding your attention. So the fact that you would give me some of your time is truly an honor. And we are gonna make sure that we get to use that time very, very wisely. So I put in the chat a question. If you haven't gotten a chance to answer it, I would really appreciate it. But the question is, if you can share, if, you, if you're open to it, share why you're here today, I would really appreciate that. There was a lot of things that I saw in this chat, but one of the big things that I've seen come up kind of over and over again is this idea of wanting to pick up some tips not just that they can use and, and that you can all use in your Rotary Clubs, but also things that you can use in your businesses, things that, that you can use in your larger communities. The other thing that I heard was and have seen so far, so keep, keep them coming, um, was this idea of service, right? How do I actually take what we're going to learn today and become an even stronger service leader? And I think that's the third theme that I've seen so far is there's a lot of talk about leadership right? I want to be a better person. I want to be a better leader. I want to make sure that I am offering something more in the communities in which I serve. And so I'm glad to hear that because that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about how we can use some of these tools and techniques to really show up even more fully, even more authentically in a way that allows it for everybody to thrive. So one of the things you know that I was talking about when the committee, who actually is an amazing group of individuals, if you don't know them yet, I encourage you to reach out and, and get to know them and get to know the work that they're doing. But one of the things that we talked quite a bit about in planning this was just the pressure, the pressure of what is happening right now in this moment. No matter really what sector you're in or what part of the community or what chapter uh, your area represents or what part of the region, there is a lot of, of pressure around what are we doing to make sure that we are really creating the most inclusive workplaces. And what does that look like when we're thinking about creating inclusive uh, community spaces? What does that look like when we're creating inclusive programming? And it's this requirement, right, of taking the things maybe that we've been doing or have done for a really long time and putting on a new lens. And it's really a lens around inclusion. And I know that that can feel a little daunting. And I know that it can feel sometimes even, for being honest, restrictive. But what I want to do is I want us to think about this. And what I want us to have by the time we get to the end of this conversation is I want us to think about this change, right, this this what's happening right now in this moment. I want us to think about it as a doorway to even greater possibilities. I want us to think about what it means to, to look at this idea of inclusion and this lens of inclusion as really the opportunity for more innovation. I want us to be able to take this moment and to really leverage it for even greater good. So, what are we going to do with our time? We're going to do all the things because there's too much to do, right? So a couple of things I just want to point out to you so you know where we're going in this conversation. The first thing that I want to do is I want to share a little background about my organization and kind of how we incorporate some of these ideas of inclusion into the work that we do. Now, I shared with the committee, I don't normally go into this level of depth, but I am going to share with you because I think it aligns so closely with the mission of the Rotary Club. The second thing that we're going to do is I am going to illustrate to you how these principles of inclusion can really help revolutionize the way that we look at the world around us. And I'm going to share a story, a, a particular story that shows how this like change in mindset and change in action and, and change in how we show up really created one of the most 
dynamic things that we have at our disposal right now in the business world. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to challenge you. Uh, so if you thought you were going to just be able to zip back and just let me go on and on and on, no, 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 friends, uh, you are going to participate in this conversation too. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to illustrate three big questions. And the questions are going to be around the metaphor of the table. Okay. Like where are we putting our table? Who's being invited to our table? And how are we acting at our table? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some time to reflect. So I definitely need you, if you don't have a pen and a piece of paper, I need you to have a pen and a piece of paper. So you're going to have some time, just a couple of minutes to kind of gather your thoughts around some of these ideas. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to give you an opportunity to share. I'm going to give you an opportunity to actually talk. We'll come back. Um, we'll open it up for some, some questions. And I will, of course, leave you with a challenge. So that's a lot to do in kind of a little bit of time. So let's go ahead and get right into it. So the very first thing that I want to do is I want to share with you a little bit about the company that I have the great pleasure of operating. So my company is called Flying Elephant. And Flying Elephant, it, you can see, is an umbrella organization for four social enterprises. Now, again, I don't typically go into this level of detail, but given the mission of the Rotary Club, this mission of providing service to others, and really trying to promote integrity and advance the world of understanding and goodwill and peace through your fellowship of business and professional and community leaders. I had to read that because it's a very long mission statement, but I think it's very important. Understanding, right, that you're out here, if I could summarize, to make the world a better place. I thought that this would be something that would resonate with you. So please indulge me as I share a little bit more about our company. So Flying Elephant has four different companies that feed into it. The first company is actually called Uplifting Impact, and that's the company I'm here uh, representing today. So Uplifting Impact, our main focus is on helping workplaces become more inclusive. And the idea really is how do we create opportunities where everybody gets the opportunity, gets the ability to thrive? right? Everybody who comes through the door really gets the idea that they can come in and bring all their best ideas and do their best work and really advance the missions of our organizations. And so we work with organizations, big and small. We have small nonprofit organizations and government agencies. And also we are the uh, prime consultant for 20 of the Fortune 500 companies. So in this company alone, I've trained over 100,000 people in just the last 12 months. Lots and lots and lots of work that we do here. The second company is called Purposeful Hustle, and that company is based off of a book that I wrote many years ago. It's a leadership book, um, again, very aligned with the mission of Rotary, because the whole idea is how do we find our purpose, right? How do we identify what we are uniquely positioned to do here in the world? And then how do we work to bring that to life? But how do we do it in a way that really advances everyone around us and really advances the larger community? So through that company, what we do is we provide services, to people who are looking to make that connection and really looking to close the gap maybe between what they feel like their purpose is and what they are doing with their day-to-day -day actions. And we do a lot of coaching there, a lot of workshops there, a lot of support really around that concept of purposeful hustle. The third company that's listed here is called Story to Tell Books. And Story to Tell Books is a children's book imprint. Uh, what it does is it actually puts out books that focus on creating positive images of children of color. So all different kinds of, of children and different backgrounds. The reason why we started this company is because right now in the United States, Children of color make up more than 50% of our school age children, but are only represented in about 14% of books. And if you ask an early education, like, you know, childhood person, like, how do you get a child excited about reading and excited about learning? One of the number one things that they will say is you help them find themselves in the work. You help them find themselves in the literature. So when 50% of the children can only find themselves in 14% of the books, we have a disconnect. And so this uh, company was actually started by my children. They are, when they were four and eight years old, they are now 11 and 15. And so they make sure that I tell everybody that they are my bosses. I've told you, full disclosure, right? Um, but it's important to note that what we do here is for every book that we sell that comes out of Story to Tell Books, we actually redistribute that money to other organizations also supporting positive images of children of color. 
And what I will point out here is that um, it's been amazing to write these books. One of the books that you see here is called Sela's Bridge that was actually written by my children when they were eight and like 11. Uh, and the cover was drawn by an 11 year old at the time too. Um, and the other book I'll just point out here too is uh, The Girl's Guide to Race and Inclusion. So I actually was approached by American Girl, if you're familiar with the American Girl brand, um, to write that book. So really a lot of fun. And then help them put four dolls out into the world in the American Girl brand that again, reflected many different cultures. Now, the last company that you see on here is called Birth Coach Milwaukee. And Birth Coach Milwaukee is a doula company. What we do there is we really focus on trying to close the birth disparities in Milwaukee. Unfortunately, if you are a woman of color in Milwaukee, you are five times more likely to have a tragic event during the birthing process. And that is something that just should not be happening. And what we do is we provide services to people at all different stages and really help coach them so that we can close uh, those gaps. So these are four very different companies, right? Um, you see up here, we have touches in education, we have touches in healthcare, we have touches in leadership, we have touches in workplace culture and change management. Um, but the thing that pulls all of them together, similar to what pulls all of you together as members of Rotary, is that we are trying to shift power to marginalized communities. So I'm not going to go through this again, but you can see, right, how that theme of really looking at those who are left on the edges, how when we pay attention, right, when we, when we say that's not okay, how we can actually use business to bring people back into the fold and really create amazing change. Now, the umbrella of this all, flying elephant, is what we call a social enterprise. And I wanted to just spend just, just a minute kind of defining what social enterprise is. This isn't a talk about social enterprise, but in many ways, what you are doing and the way that you're approaching the work that you're doing is a social enterprise. And so I think it's good to have this definition. Social enterprises are created to solve for an economic or social or cultural or environmental challenge. So again, when we look at what we do and how we're doing it, our whole thing is how are we shifting power? The second thing that's really important about a social enterprise is that there is a service or a product. This is not just feel goodery. This is about, yes, we want to make sure that we are entering into the market with something that is viable, something that can actually cause uh, people to participate in what we consider to be traditional business. And then one of the key distinguishing factors is that profit is actually reinvested into the fulfillment of the mission, right? So we take what we are earning and we bring it back to really create more impact. And so when you look at social enterprises, how we're defining whether or not we're successful, it's not just on, oh, do we make you know some more money? It's really on what is the change that we're making? How are we creating something that's sustainable? Now, the reason why I wanted to do this is because I think it's important to understand the model. I think it's important to understand how you know the, the organization works and how we operate. But I also think it's important because it's really the foundation of the story that I want to tell. Now, I have been a, a scholar. I think it's okay for me to say scholar. That sounds really formal, but I'll say it. I'm going to own it. Scholar uh, of social enterprise and also a practitioner of the social enterprise space for many, many, many years. And in all that time that I've been doing that work, uh, one of my very favorite people um, in the space who I think has made, and not just that I think, but really has made a tremendous amount of change is a gentleman by the name of Muhammad Yunus. And so I want to tell you the story of Muhammad Yunus. Now, Muhammad Yunus is often considered the father of microfinance. Don't worry, friends. If some of you were going to push that exit button because you're like, I did not sign up to have a conversation about microfinance, I promise you that is not what we're about to do. <laughs> but I do think it's important to understand um, his role in this very, very big area of the world. Now, what, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about how this gentleman, Muhammad Yunus, looked at the world in a little bit different way. And because he was able to look at the world in a different way, he was able to create something that didn't, at least to the level of prominence that we know it now, did not exist. This is a beautiful example also of what happens when we take these ideas and these conversations and the things you know that we've been maybe thinking about or talking about amongst ourselves and actually put some action behind it. It's a beautiful story of what happens when we take things out of theory and put them into reality. 
So what I want to do is I want to show you how Muhammad Yanis was able to take this idea and this, this concept of inclusion and apply it in the banking world to create literally one of the most innovative and impactful vehicles that we have today in the world of finance. It's so powerful that it actually earned him a Nobel Peace Prize. But most importantly, it changed fundamentally the life trajectory of thousands and thousands of people around the world. So I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me back up a little bit and let me tell you how this story started. So Dr. Yunus um, is an economist. He's actually an economist who comes from Bangladesh. And at the time that he uh, was doing this work, he was actually a professor and he was working at a university. Now this is 1976. And he believed, and this is important to hear me say this, he believed that one of the most wild, widely, excuse me, widely held philosophies of bankers was not true. Now, what was this philosophy that he wanted to contest, right? That's what economists do. He wanted to contest the idea that poor people living in rural areas were unfinanceable. Okay, so there was this idea that if you were a poor person, you were living in rural Bangladesh, you were not somebody that could be trusted with any of the financial models or any of the financial mechanisms that were available at the day, of the day. But what he did believe, right, he didn't think that was true, but what he did believe was that poor people were not lacking in resources they, or excuse me, that they were not lacking in what was kind of being, you know, shared then, that they weren't trustworthy or they didn't have financial sensibility, but that what they were actually lacking was resources. And so he had a hunch. And his hunch was that if he could, and it was a simple concept, but it had a revolutionary impact. His hunch was that he could take a very small bit of money, put it into a poverty stricken village or area or group of people, and that not only would they prove that they were financially sensible, but also that they had a great deal of trustworthiness. So he wanted to take this concept and he wanted to see if he could flip it on his head. So this is what he did. So simple, friends. He took 27 US dollars and he gave it to a group of 42 basket weavers. Okay, let's talk about this. 27 US dollars and gave it to 42 basket weavers. And guess what? You want to hear what the results were? Not only did this little small experiment, right, show to be wildly successful in the fact that the women repaid him, but also, and that's what he was trying to prove, right? That they were trustworthy, that they had financial sensibility. He was able to prove it. But the other thing he was able to prove was that it could be profitable because the women, there wasn't a lot, were actually able to make a small profit. Now this seemingly small experiment actually gave birth to the idea of microcredit. And let me tell you what is going on right now. So this led to what is now considered Grameen and it's called Grameen Banking for the Poor. But here are some of the statistics to just keep in mind about this organization. Now. 93% of all of the villages in Bangladesh have some kind of representation of Grameen Bank. In addition to that, there are over 9 million members, not just in Bangladesh, but across the world. 97% of those people are women. And here's the one, whenever I share this story with bankers where they're like, <laughs> right, I hear in the audience, I don't know if any of you are doing that, but um, if you are, I'm with you that the repayment rate is 99%. Now, I don't know if any of you are out there in the financial world, but I would really encourage you to go look at what the repayment rate is in more traditional spaces. And I will tell you, hands down, that this is higher, right? So all of the things that, that Dr. Yunus was thinking about, all the things that he had in his mind as hunches actually became true. And here's the thing that really, really gets me. There's a presence of this organization in now 64 countries worldwide. But more importantly than all of these numbers and statistics and everything, because that can you can lose the humanness in this, is that as a result of Grameen Bank being in um, 
being in, in, in motion. Sorry, I got really excited, Angela, because I saw that you got to meet him and now I'm super jealous. She just put that into the chat. Uh, but the fact that this exists, right, and, and that this is out here and that this is in the world has meant that millions of people have been able to lift themselves out of extreme poverty. And what that means is that the livelihood of the individuals who have been able to do that, but not just them, of their greater family, of their communities has actually changed. Now, I know that this is a great story. I know because every time I get the opportunity to tell it, I get so excited. But we're here to talk about, not microfinance as I've already promised you, but we're here to talk about this idea of inclusion. So what is the connection between this story and between the idea of inclusion? Well, the way that I look at it, right, the way that I see it, there were three fundamental questions that Dr. Yunus asked that really illuminate what we talk about when we're talking about this idea of inclusion. And they're the three questions that I shared with you before. Where is the table being put? Who's being invited to the table? And what is happening at the table? So let me go and break this down for you just a little bit further. The first question is, where are we putting the table? Right, so this is metaphorical. Where are we putting to the, the table? And when we're thinking about this metaphor, I want you to be thinking about the places where you have influence. So think about whether that's in your community, whether that's in your business, maybe that's in the Rotary. Where are the places where you have influence, where you are sitting at different tables in your own life? And I want us to be thinking about these questions as we're going through it. So the first question, where are we putting the table? Well, let's think about what Dr. Yunus was seeing and what he decided to do that was different. Before Grameen Bank, and to a large degree, even still today, banks are typically located in cities, right? Even cities that look bigger than this. Um, you can think about, you know, areas that have high rises, that are close to big industry, right? Where there's a lot of people who have much higher incomes. But where you don't see banking happening, is in more rural communities where people are not close to some of these big institutions. You can see in the picture to the right, right? There, there isn't a building to be seen in, in anywhere in that picture. So when we're thinking about this concept and we're kind of thinking about where he was in this moment, Dr. Yunus realized that there is a high, high concentration of these resources and access to financial tools and, and financial mechanisms being offered in cities. But when I look over here, right, adjacent to these big cities, I don't see that. And what was the underlying thought, right? Why don't we see institutions coming out into these rural areas? Well, there's a couple of things that are at play here. One is there's an assumption that only the most affluent, affluent, affluent why can't I say the word, only the most rich, right, amongst us could be customers. There was also, on the opposite side of that, that poor people were not credit worthy and that they therefore could not be customers and that they didn't need to have access to these financial vehicles. They, it was this thought, right, that because they didn't have a traditional background, they didn't have what we consider to be traditional pay or traditional ways of getting paid, that they would not actually be able to pay back their loans. And if you kept going down this line of thought, that they actually did not therefore have any financial acumen. So you could see how one thought led to the next, led to the next, led to the next, right? Ah, oh, if you're in a rural area, it means that you don't have any money. Oh, if you don't have any money, it means that you don't have good ways of getting money or, or keeping money or using money. If you don't have good ways to keep or use money, then you don't really have any financial acumen. And therefore, I don't need to be present in your space. Now, what this is, is a clear example of what we call framing bias. So if you're taking notes, this is one that I would write down. Framing bias is, the, is defined as uh, what drives the brain to make assumptions about particular data based on general data. So this happens and, and we do it all the time, right? We, we see something, we come up with an idea about it. And as soon as we come up with an idea about it, we make everything fit into that frame. It's considered a frame, right? Because it's like, there's hard edges to it. So the minute I start thinking something about a city, or a part of the city, or a person, or a group, I start to create this frame. And then anything that doesn't fit within the frame, I just discount, 
I, I don't even take into consideration. So if I have a framing bias, I might be, you know, thinking like, oh, people in rural areas don't have money. They don't have financial acumen. And so what that would do is it would forbid me or it would get in the way of me seeing, yeah, but they're running farms and they're creating jobs and they are, uh, they are right. Having these conversations or doing something in order to make sure that there's food on the table for their families and, and being able to create the well-being for their families. So I wouldn't see all those things, right? All I would see is what was already in my frame. Now, I'm going to be sharing a couple of different biases here. And I just really want to make this point as we go through it. When I'm talking about these biases, I am not talking about anybody being a bad person. The reality is, is that in order for us to function in the world, every single one of us has biases. Let me just start by saying, I'm a, an inclusion expert. At least that's what people tell me every day. And I have biases because it's part of the human experience. We can't take every piece of new information that we have and not filter it through what we already know. But what I'm gonna show you are these three biases that we're gonna go through tonight is I'm gonna show you what they are and help you name them. And I'm gonna help you name them because once you do that, you can start to retrain your brain to actually see them when they pop up. So do I have framing bias? Oh, absolutely, right? I have my favorite place to go get bagels. It's my favorite place because the bagels are perfection. It, they're so good. They make them perfectly every single time. If you were to ask me, Deanna, where do you want to go get bagels? My first thought is going to be this other place. Because I have that frame, if you bring another bagel to me, in order for me to appreciate it, for me to be able to see it as it is, taste it as it is, enjoy it thoroughly, I have to get rid of my frame. I have to be able to challenge myself to step outside of it and open myself up to the, to the assumption that maybe my frame is not wide enough to actually include all the best bagels in the world. Uh, heads up, if you want me to tell you where the best bagel is, I'm happy to do that later on. But that's neither here nor there. I just want to make sure that everybody understands what this looks like and why and how it comes into play. So Dr. Eunice, right, might not have called it the framing bias, but this is how Dr. Eunice actually broke that frame. This is what it looks like when you do it in business. So he created an entirely new marketplace because going back to that first question of where are we putting the tables, what he decided to do was not to go to the places where everybody already was, right? Not to go to the places where all the other banks already existed, but instead he went to the places where nobody was. He went to the poorest villages where other banks were not even considering going and being open to this idea of, you know, thinking more inclusively and thinking more creatively about where I might go. He was able to find a place to do business where there was basically no competition, right? He was able to open up an entirely new market. An entirely new market that was being underserved. So I want you to think about that in your worlds now too, right? Think about the places where you're serving or you're working and or you're you're showing up as a leader. And I want you to think about what are some of the frames that you might be using about where you go and how you access the the kinds of opportunities or the kinds of experiences or even the kinds of business that you want to do. And I really want you to spend just a few minutes here thinking about what are some ways that you might be making assumptions about particular data, right, based on general data. And I put general data in quotation marks because it's the data that we've decided, it's not all data, it's the data that we've decided to put into our frames. Now I'm gonna put some music on for just two minutes and I'm gonna be quiet and I am going to give you the opportunity to just reflect on that. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is going to be a meta moment is because a lot of times when we're going through these conversations, it's just like somebody talking, 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 and I don't want to be like a talking head. I really want this to be something that you are using to activate your own mindset. So when I give you these moments, this is not for you to check your emails, not for you to be checking what's on your phone. I know that temptation, but fight it and really take a minute to think about where you might be doing this in your own work. I don't want you to share this. Don't put this in the chat. This is not a quiz that I'm going to be collecting, but I'm giving you the challenge because I think that it's so powerful when we as leaders take a moment to really try and challenge ourselves. 
Okay, so two minutes, I'm going to start the timer. And I would love for you to go ahead and just think about this. Um, it'll help you when we get into our groups later on. All right, I'll see you in just a moment. All right, so hopefully that gave you just a little bit of time. I know it wasn't enough, um, but just a little bit of time to collect your your ideas and to collect what your what your thoughts are. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Let's go to that next question. So the next question is, who is being invited to the table? So who is getting an invitation to actually come and participate in the work that we're doing or the opportunities that we have? Now, when he asked this question, one of the things that Dr. Yunus identified right away, and you could see this even in the very first experiment that he did, was that the glaring reality was that men and only men were being invited. Women were actually not represented in the banking world at all. So women traditionally had less access to financial alternatives of ordinary credit limits and also of incomes. So when we think about money in general, it wasn't just lending or borrowing. It was all the ways that we think about money. Right now, 1.6 billion people don't have access to financial services. And of those, 70% of them are women. Even as late as 2024, excuse me, 2004, women only represented about 1% of loans in Bangladesh. 1%, right? So you can imagine just how hard it is if you have an idea, if you're entrepreneurial, if your family ha comes into a, a situation where they need to access additional capital, how constricting it is if your entire group is not even allowed to participate. So one of the things that he saw was not only was this happening, but also that women actually played a pivotal role and really were making big changes in their families, but they were doing it without access to money. And so one of the thoughts was, well, what happens if they're already doing it and they're already playing this key role? What happens if they actually could access capital? What would change, right? How, how would that impact the communities around them and their families? And so one of the things that was going on right then, and, and one of the things that were happening, and the reason why you weren't seeing a lot of women who were participating is because there was this sense of, of a confirmation bias. And I wanted to find what confirmation bias is. It's the tendency to search for or interpret or recall information that confirms your beliefs more frequently than information that contradicts it. Now, this is something that wasn't just happening in Bangladesh. This wasn't just happening in the finance world. This is something that happens literally on an everyday basis. And I'll give you another uh, personal story here, not about food this time. This time I'll tell you one about my children. And I'll tell you exactly how this works and has worked with me. So one of the things uh, that my children love to do is they love to play video games. There you've got all kinds of things. I don't understand a word of how they do it and, and what it looks like, right? But they love it. And so one day my children came to me and they said, mom, and they came to my husband and I, who, you know, happens to be a professor and also does this work. And uh, they said, you know, mom and dad, guess what? We found this article that says that children should play video games as much as possible because it really helps their brains grow. Now, knowing who we are as researchers, right? Knowing who we are as, as educators, uh, my children did a really good job of finding a way to convince us, right? Like that what their idea of what needed to happen was the right idea. But what I have to tell you is that one of the things that we did right away, again, because we are researchers, we said, oh, that's really interesting. Can we see where you got that source from? And I don't remember exactly where the source was, but it was something like www trick your your parents into letting you play video games all the time .com, right? Like it was it was that kind of a source. And one of the things that was really interesting about it is that we pointed that out to the children. We said, "Hey, look, you know what? You found some research. You found an article, but you went to a place and you were searching for and interpreting this article in a way that would further what you already wanted us to decide, right?" And, and they said, oh, yeah, I guess we didn't really see it that way. Or maybe they did, and, and they were just trying to play, play, play around with us. But either way, they had a confirmation bias. But I have to tell you that it wasn't the children that were the ones who were just wrong. 
because I also found information and I've gone to, right? Like parenting against technology.com. And again, that doesn't really exist, but that's right. The, the source wasn't um, something that was really neutral. And I found the exact opposite. Like should never be playing video games and they should not, because I was trying to confirm my own bias. And I'm giving you this as an example because I want you to see that this is not something that's far-fetched, right? This is something that we do all the time. And I think now in this beautiful time that we live in, this information age where everything is really at our fingertips, we can literally find, and sometimes we don't even have to find because of the algorithms, it can find us the information that we need to confirm the ideas that we already have. And so in this situation, what was happening was that there was a realization that this confirmation bias was causing people to overlook a huge population. There was this bias that only men were people who could be part of the financial world. And so what did we look for, right? What was being looked for from people who are in the banking industry? Well, they were looking at, well, we only finance men and men therefore are the most financeable. And so therefore women can't be financeable, but it was just confirming what they were already doing, right? What was already happening. And so what do we do when we see this confirmation bias pop up in our own lives? And how do we actually deal with it? And, and what happens and how do we how do we push it into a place where it doesn't get in the way of us being innovative and doesn't get in the way of us seeing what could be done differently? Well, Dr. Yunus did a beautiful job of showing how to do that because he decided that he was going to break the confirmation bias by actually going against it, looking at what are the things that are being put out here as like truth, and this is the only way we could think about it. And how do I actually go at that information and think about it in a different kind of way? You saw on the earlier slide that one of the things that he did that was majorly transformational is he with intention decided, I'm gonna do the exact opposite of what all the other people in the banking world are gonna do. I am going to actively go after women. Now, what happened as a result of this? Now, even to this day, 97% of the people who are borrowers are women. And what they saw was that this, this inequitable share of power, right? Like what was happening in household decision-making and, and what was happening with financial power, that that entire dynamic got interrupted. So not only were women able to borrow and do the things that they had been dreaming about, but it actually changed the ability to be self-advocates and to be able to show up in different ways inside of their communities. Now, doing that and being able to lend um, to women opened up so many different things and really opened up the mindset of what could be done and what could be possible. One of the things that resulted, and this has been proven over and over again, not just through Grameen Bank, but through a number of different uh, social studies that have been done around women, is that when women actually have access to economic power, what it does is it creates a lot of secondary effects, including empowerment of marginalized segment of the population, a better share of income, more children going to school, children staying in school, just health impacts uh, more largely as it relates to birth. I mean, it, you can go on and on and on and on about these secondary impacts that extend beyond just the financial impact of being able to have that power. So when we think about this question and we think about how does this apply to us, the question I want you all to be thinking about, and this is again, another personal reflection. We're just gonna do a quick little two minutes here. Um, but what I want you to be thinking about is this question. What are some of the things that might be in our everyday personal or professional lives that we see being confirmed? Now, an easy way to ask this question are what are some things that are just like Consider to be the truth, like the, the, we can't, we don't even contest it, right? It, we just walk into spaces and we just make an assumption that this is what everybody believes. And this is how we should be operating. I will tell you that every innovative business that has ever been created, everything that has ever broken a big system has started out with that question. What are the things that we just take for granted that are, are that can't be contested, that can't, that we, that we, that we don't actually look at? that we've just been copying and pasting year after year after year. And how do we look at them differently? So again, give you a fast two minutes, but I want you to think about this question. No need to share publicly, but just write down on your paper. Um, what are some things that might be showing up in your own personal and professional life? See you back in two minutes.
Sorry about that. I said, uh, I know that we're going through these really quickly and I understand that, but the idea is to give you the questions so that you can go back to them um, at a later time. I was trying to write my own answers and didn't get to finish it in the two minutes. So I'm sure others uh, weren't able to do the same, but I appreciate you even just starting uh, to start having that conversation and ignite those thoughts. So let's get to the third question. And this third question is the one that I always uh, have a little giggle at, right? And I, I think I giggle at this because I think about um, my my own upbringing and I think about my my parents saying, like, make sure that we we sit down at this table, right? That you're that you're behaving uh, accordingly and that you're you're doing what you know you're supposed to do and what you've been taught to do. And I think this question of not just who are we inviting at the table and where we're putting the table, but also how we're acting at the table is really important because I, in all the work that I've done, I've seen a lot of people maybe put tables in, in new places and maybe they are, you know, um, making sure that they're inviting people to the table, but then how they treat people is really not right at all. And so this last question is, how are we acting at the table? Now, one of the things that I think Muhammad Yunus like really honed in on, and I think this was re, um, this became an even greater appreciation over the many years that the bank has been in existence, is that it's important that people actually feel like they can come to the bank, that the bank is meant for them, that it really is something that they can access, that it, it has them in mind. And so one of the things that he noticed when he looked at the banking structure is that it was being done in a way, and some of the things and mechanisms of how it was used were done in a way that really were not inviting, right? If you think about living in a rural community and then going into the city, that means I got to get transportation. That means I'm in an environment that I'm not comfortable in, or maybe I don't have a lot of information about. I got to have access to a car. I've got to go into a building that looks very different than anything that I've ever experienced before. And so there's all these other, so it's not just I have to have the courage and the know without to be able to get into the bank. But now I also have to like take all these other things that are just as, as potentially anxiety producing for me and add it on top. So the cost was very different than somebody who was from the city, understood the city, was comfortable in the city. The cost was even higher for somebody to come from a rural community because of that transportation, because of that baggage, because of just that feeling of discomfort. So one of the things that he decided to do was really think about this idea of self-agency right? To think about how do we not put people in a position where that power dynamic is at play before they even open their mouths, before they even arrive? What would that look like? And how do we do it in a way that does not constantly pull power away from people, does not constantly other them, does not, does not constantly push them into the margins? And one of the ways that they realized uh, doing that was that it, when we're doing this, we have to think about how we're maybe helping people or walking alongside people in a way that doesn't actually also exclude them. So what this is and kind of what he saw at play here and how I would define what was going on and why this was happening, right? Why, why, why were we, if we knew that these were, there was already barriers, why were we adding more barriers to people is because of a thing that we call the status quo bias. Now, this is one that I think speaks a little bit for itself, right? Because many of us on the call have heard the idea of status quo before. But the way that this one is defined is it's really defined as the tendency to prefer the current state of things, no matter how wrong they might be. So in the instance that we're talking about with Dr. Yunus, we could see that there was whole swaths of community that were not getting access to banking whole swaths that we're not getting access to this ability to really create financial growth. And instead of changing the behavior, right, and trying to think about it creatively, like what would eliminate some of these barriers that have nothing to do with what we're trying to achieve here? There was like a, a nope, we're going to just keep holding on to it. We're going to build even higher towers. We're going to make them even more uh, ominous. We're going to make them even more scary. We're going to make them even more difficult to get to. Not the opposite of how do we actually eliminate some of those barriers. Now, I think this one is really, really interesting because I see this at play in so many organizations that I work with. And I actually see this at play in a lot of leaders that I work with too. And I'm going to start again by saying this is not because people are bad people. It's because we're human and we have so many things that we have to accomplish in the day. Even while I've been sitting here with trying to turn everything off, I'm sure when I turn this, I'm going to have like 25 emails, right? So many text messages, all these different things that are just pinging in all these different directions, because that is the world that we live in. 
And so oftentimes what our brain wants to do is it wants to find a clear pathway, something that's going to be easy for us to do. And when we have walked down a pathway a number of times, and that pathway is already well tread, then it's easier for us to say, you know what, I'm going to go back down that pathway again. Even if I know that if I go this other direction, I might get there faster. I might be able to bring more people along with me. And I'm going to give you a perfect example of this. Um, every day, right? I, I participate in a commute, almost every day, participate in, in a commute. Now, my husband and I are very different people. We have to take our son to school in the morning time. My husband will take the exact same path every single day. Now, does he look at the traffic? Does he like pull up, you know, the thing where it shows you the orange and red and everything? Nope. He just leaves on time and he takes the same path every day. Me, on the other hand, I'm not like that because I'm more open to change. And, I, and so what I will do is I'll look at the thing. I want to go down the street. I've never gone down. I want to do, because I, I want to, to move around in those different spaces. It doesn't make one of us right or one of us wrong, right? It, that's not, it's not a value judgment thing. It's just in that instance, in that example, he is going to go with what is the status quo. He's not going to try and look for what is a different pathway to take. Again, doesn't make him a bad person. It makes him human. It also makes me late quite often. So let's also just acknowledge that, right? But at the same time, it is this idea of how do we push against the status quo? So what Muhammad Yunus realized in this situation and what he was experiencing was that there was this huge group of, this huge population was just, that was just not being served. And so what he did was he really changed the way that he approached this work. And the way that he changed it was he thought about the power dynamics and he thought, well, how do we actually shift this power dynamic? Now, there's a number of ways that he did this, but I want to give you at least two practical examples. One is that he moved to this idea of solitary, solidarity lending. And what that meant was that it was a practice where you didn't just make a loan to one person, but you actually did it to a group and the group was able to borrow collectively. Now, the reason why this was so fundamentally powerful is because what it did was it built in a natural mechanism for group members to be able to encourage each other, right? It built up this idea that we are all in this together and we're all able to support one another. The other thing that it did was it eliminated some of that overhead cost that was really prohibitive for people to be able to participate. So instead of having this one cost of, you know, going through a loan that somebody had to manage themselves, they actually were able to have a fixed cost and that fixed cost could be shared amongst multiple people and amongst multiple people were able to manage it. Now that saved a lot in administrative costs. It also saved a lot in management costs and it also made it much more feasible and responsible for the bank to be able to provide loans to people and for people to be able to do the work. The other thing that they did that was genius was they actually started thinking about instead of having people in buttoned up suits and, you know, the, the way that a banker traditionally looked in the minds of people who are in the village, what they decided to do instead was to hire community agents. So really looking at how do we build up trust with people who already have the trust of community members, people who they already know. We don't have to do this in a brick and mortar place. We can actually go out into the villages and go out into the communities. And so in other words, what they did was they set up this borrowing system in a manner that gave power back, that gave authority back, that was creative enough to allow for people to really see themselves in a space that they before had not seen themselves. And the benefit was that on the side of the borrower, you got more ownership rights, you got more access, you got more resources. And on the side of the bank, they were able to have great savings, right? They were able to get into markets that didn't formally have another entry point. So I'm going to give you one last reflection question, and then we're going to review quick and, and go into our groups and you'll get a chance to talk. But here is the last reflection question. And this one is really about this idea of status quo, right? What are some of the things where you might be seeing status quo and you're, it's impacting the way that you're looking at a situation? So another way to ask this question is what are the things that we are always doing because we've always done it that way, right? What are the things that when we say, well, why do we do that? Well, it's because we always did it that way. How do we actually think about those things and challenge those things? Okay, so another quick two minutes and then I will see you back in a second. All right, 
So now it is actually your turn. Um, and now it's your turn to really think about these concepts, right? And just a quick review. The first thing that we talked about was this idea of framing bias, this frame and how we sometimes create the frame and therefore can't see the things that are outside of it. And we talked about how when uh, Dr. Yunus was able to break that frame, he created a marketplace that had little to no competition. The second thing that we talked about was this idea of confirmation bias, right? This idea that I'm going to see the things that already exist and I'm going to look for the things that already support the ideas that I have in my mind. And when Muhammad Yunus was able to walk away from that, he actually was able to see and be able to support uh, women, making women 97% of the borrows that come from Grameen Bank. And the third thing we talked about was this idea of status quo bias, right? The idea that even if it's not necessarily the best thing for me, I am going to go ahead and I'm going to keep doing it because it's what I always do, is what I've always done. And by breaking that apart, he was able to actually shift the power dynamic. So I want us to think about those, right? And when we understand them, again, bias doesn't make you bad. Bias is something that's a normal part of our brain. But once we understand them and how they might be getting in the way of us being able to really move things forward, that gives us, uh, that gives us power. That gives us the ability to show up as better leaders. And so the question I want us to ask, and we're going to go into breakout rooms until about uh, uh, 15 minutes to um, the hour. So we'll be there till 4.45 if you're in central time, um, is I want you to ask this question. And I want you to just have a conversation with the people in your group about what you learned here today, right? These ideas, this concept, this story, and how you might be able to use that in your spheres of influence. So I really want you to think about how you take this back into the places where you have some power or some influence and how you actually use them. Now we're gonna go into these rooms. And one of the things I just wanna encourage you to do is to make sure that when you're in the rooms, you're making them inclusive, okay? So friends, we wanna hear from everybody. So make sure that you give the opportunity to do a round robin and give everybody the chance who wants to speak the opportunity to talk. Uh, make sure that you are sharing the space, right? This isn't a time to just stand on our platforms. It really is a time to be able to learn from one another. What I will tell you is that I like to pop around in the rooms. If you see me, you don't need to acknowledge me. I'm just nosy. And I like to hear what people are, people are talking about. So we will see you back here at uh, 4.45. And, um, and I'm really looking forward to it. So please enjoy. Okay. Well, welcome back. Welcome back. I always think about this as this, like coming through the hallway, all getting back into the same room. So welcome back into the room. Um, I really enjoyed being a fly on the wall in your conversations. There was a lot of great, great things that were happening as you all were talking about what this looks like. And so what I'd love to do is open up the floor really to give us an opportunity to hear from one another. Um, I'm very curious about some of the things that you may have talked about in your group. You don't have to just say who said what. But um, if there were any like aha moments that you had or, or things that you really wanted to share, um, this is an excellent opportunity to do that. So I would love to go ahead and just open it up um, for that. But I would also love to, and, and I welcome um, any questions you might have along the way too. So if you have a question or you have an aha moment you want to share, you can go ahead and use the um, button at the bottom that is the raise hand function and we'll go ahead and, and call on you. And if you can't find it, like I can never find it, just raise your hand and we'll try and see you also. <laughs> or you can put a chat, a message in the chat and uh, we can pick it up. Absolutely. Well, hearing nothing, seeing nothing at the chat right moment at this moment, there was a couple of things that um, I that struck me as I was going through, and part of it was in our in our vision statement talked about creating lasting change in, in across the globe in our communities and in ourselves, and I was really talking wanting us to focus in on ourselves and in our communities this year, and uh, going backwards. Um, acting at the table and status quo. And one of the things that I, what popped in my mind is 
at our Rotary Club meetings, there's typically there's people sit at specific tables, and um, and, and you know how do we a kind of try and help encourage safely encourage others, but then also not necessarily uh, so for one or the other uh, detractors for me with uh, with going with the status quo is then I also come to the table sometimes self editing because I don't know how you know is it, it's it's going to go against the status quo and I want to be disruptive a little bit but I don't want to be a disruption. Mm. Oh, I love that. Thank you. And I, I'm going to uh, re respond to it too. I'm going to try not to respond to all of them because I do really want to hear from you, but there's a couple of things I just wanted to say about that. So I think one of the things, you know, that we talk about a lot in um, Action Speak Louder is we really talk about this idea of how do we create systems and structures that allow for us to break some of those, um, some of those norms up, right? And a lot of what we talk about and in, in what, I, what I write about in the book is how do we think about things from a very intentional space? And how do we think about things as opportunities? So even at the example, and it's interesting that you mentioned this, Don, because in two other rooms, I heard people talking about how we come to our meetings and we all sit at the same spot. And so when you know that that's something that you're noticing or that you're seeing, right, or there's something that's happening that's kind of like a creating like a norm and maybe um, discluding people or excluding people, maybe not intentionally, but kind of by, by practice, is thinking about how could I do this differently? And so I'll give you a couple of examples of, of ways that we've seen people do even just that example in and of itself, right? Just if we were brainstorming. So one would be um, what we've decided to do is we've given all the name tags and we've actually randomly put them in the room. So please go find your name tag and sit where your name tag is. It's really simple. It's not super aggressive. It's just an opportunity. Another thing that we've seen people do, and I'm sure you've participated in this to some degree is, hey, we gave everybody your name tags. You have different stickers on your name tags. Some of you have a star. Some of you have a red heart. Some of you have a green frog. And what I want you to do is I want you to go find somebody else who has a, the, same, the same one as you. And I want you to go meet with them. Okay, now I want you to find somebody who's completely opposite of what you have on yours and go meet with them. Now, the third one I want you to do is I want you to find one that has the same color as you do or a different color than what your sticker is. And I want you to sit next to that person, right? So we make it a little fun to try and activate these different kinds of opportunities. And I will tell you just from a human perspective, we all know what it feels like to go into a room and feel like, hmm, I don't know if I really belong here, right? Like that, the, the, the example I can think of that we see all the time in the movies is like first day of school, you're holding your lunch tray so tight and you're like, what table can I sit at? Or it's time to pick the, who's gonna be on the kickball team and you're like, oh my gosh, somebody just say my name and say it correctly so I don't end up with a name that's not my own, right? Like we've had these moments. And so how do we think about being more intentional of dismantling those moments? So that's one of the kind of examples that we talk about in the book is we talk about intentionality. And when you notice it, it means if you've noticed it, somebody else has probably noticed it too. And that could be an opportunity to think of something fun that really breaks it up. Uh, we do this in meetings, right? Like we're going to pass around a baton and everybody has to touch the baton. They can say they don't want to talk and just keep it passing, but we're at least going to give everybody the chance to do it. And we'll make them, instead of a baton, our company's called Flying Elephant. Let's pass the elephant. I wish I could reach right now, but I have elephant ears up here. And so sometimes we use the elephant ears and I put them on. It's like, I have a good idea, right? It's just a funny way to be like, I'm going to break it up a little bit. So well, how, how, how do we do that? And what does that look like in practice? The second thing, John, that you came to is how do I disrupt without being a disruption? Amazing. You didn't ask it as a question, but I'm going to answer it as if it was a question because I love that. When we see a lot of people getting into this bandwagon, right? Like where it's like they, everybody becomes a yes person. And what, what I mean by that is that somebody puts an idea out and instead of like kind of thinking about the idea critically, we just get into a like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I am such a uh, terrible person at this because part of my like speech pattern is I say, right? right? You know what I'm talking about, right? And it's a terrible thing. It's a terrible tick that I have and I know it and I'm working on it, friends. So if I start doing it till the end, don't 
call me out on every one of them. You can if you want to, but then you'll be writing in the chat a lot, right? Because that's what I do. I know it's a tick that I have. But I think it's important for us in order to break that, we have to think creatively about what we also put into our structures. So one of the examples that we like to use about is we actually encourage teams that we work with to create intentional moments of disruption, right? So we say, oh, we got to the end of our conversation. Now what I want us to do is I want us to spend 10 minutes and I want us to talk about why this conclusion that we came up with is not the right conclusion, right? I Let's see how many different ideas we could actually put up on the table. Let's see how many things we could think about that are opposite of where of what we've concluded. Now, if I have said that, and I'm the one who's leading the meeting, and I have given room for that disruption to happen, and I've invited it into the conversation, it makes it feel a lot less personal, right? It makes it feel a lot more like we are engaging in this larger conversation together, and we've invited this space, and so we've created the space. So one of my favorite things to say is like, okay, this is my idea. Now what I'd really love for you to do is tell me all the reasons why it doesn't, not going to work. Let's go. Because I've created that space and created that opportunity. So I think to get to your point, Don, like that's what you do, right? Is you, it doesn't become a disruption if it's part of, if the disruption is actually part of the agenda. Then Raj, I think you were going to mention. Yeah, that. there's a question here. How do we resolve the rotary effort on DEI with the political effort to kill it. Yeah. So what I will tell you right now um, is that you're seeing a lot of things in the news, right? And we're seeing a lot of um, really, I would say, like intense headlines. The, the one I got sent earlier today was, we should ban DEI, right? And so you're seeing these things and, and they're popping up. And I think that it's important to recognize that that's the reality of what is happening in the world around us. But I think there's a couple of things that I like to share with people. Number one, this is not new, right? This like idea that we're going to um, really have some resistance to change or we're going to have some resistance to conversations about including other people, that is not new. This has been around for a long time. It's shown up in a lot of different forms. Um, but it, but it's been with us. And those of us who have been in the practice could go back and do a historical anthology, right? Of like what it looked like in 2019, what it looked like in 2008, what it looked like. It was always there. It just feels like right now it's a little bit more visceral. I think it feels like right now it's much more tied into like moral terms. You're a bad person if you don't understand diversity, equity, inclusion. You're a bad person if you support this. You're a bad, right? And it's 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 really tied into um, some other things that are outside of it. But here are a couple of things that I would remind you of as you're either entering into these conversations or trying to figure out your way forward. Number one, it's not new. So take a deep breath. You can do it with me. And just realize we've been here before and we will get through right to the other side. Number two, these conversations that we're having, um, I'm going to share this with you. This may be disclosing too much and you're going to see a different version of this probably in my public spaces, but I, I feel like we're friends. So I'll share it. Like this one on ban DEI, I, I really took it and I had to take a moment where I took a breath. And then I wrote this whole thing and it was a memo. I don't know in what form or if I ever will publish this, right? But the memo was essentially like, you know what? Hey, everybody. So excited to be able to share this memo with you because we have some changes that are coming through our organization. When you come to the organization on Monday, it's really important that you understand that from henceforth and forevermore, you are no longer allowed to bring any new original ideas. You are only allowed to share the same ideas that you've had every single time that you come to this organization prior. Uh, we've mm -hmm. sent out a uniform. Um, if your hair is a different color, everybody's hair has to be the same color. Uh, everybody's hair has to, everybody has to wear the same uniform. Um, you are not allowed to, uh, you know, if you're taller or if you're not, if you're not at this height, we're going to need you to figure out a way to get to be this height, right? You can see how ridiculous this is. Oh, and by the way, um, we are going to pay some of you, uh, you know, six figures. The other people, we are going to pay you in stickers. I don't know what I'm thinking about stickers a lot today, but we're going to pay you in stickers. And uh, we're going to ask you all to do the same amount of work. As a matter of fact, we might even ask the people who are paying in stickers to do more work. 
but you know, it's all good. We're so excited that you're also going to be excited about these things. Oh, and by the way, when you come here, it's just going to be part of our practice that we are going to treat you really terribly. We're going to make you feel like you don't belong. And, um, we're going to not invite you to any of the things that we, that we're doing. I know how much you love working here and we just can't wait to see you on Monday morning. <laughs> right. I heard the giggle. <laughs> and we all should be giggling because it's ridiculous. The fact of the matter is I just explained diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Diversity is having different thoughts, different ideas, different mindsets. Equity is about making sure that we are creating, not treating everybody the same, but that we're being mindful and inclusion, right? That people actually feel like they can thrive, that they belong. We would live in a ridiculous world if we did not have these as core values in the organizations in which we work in. Right. So the idea that this could be banned or that it's going away or that there's, ugh, no, it's not. Because this has been part of the human experience since the very beginning of our existence. We need each other in order to do the things that we want to do, right? That is why we are not the smartest animals. We are not the strongest animals, but what are we? We're the most collaborative. We know how important it is to work with one another. It's our superpower. And so stripping that away doesn't actually serve anybody. So sorry, I went on a little bit of a rant there, but I think that's that's how I would say. one, it's not new. Take a deep breath. It's full of emotions, but you don't have to, you know, respond in that way. You can just look at it from the same way that we look at all kinds of change. Change is hard. And two, it's not going anywhere because it can't. We wouldn't function. That was a very long one. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Do you think uh, I should publish that memo, friends, or do you think I should just like let it let it go? Mm, um, I really I need some sound advice. At least share it with us. <laughs> Love the memo. <laughs> <laughs> Love the memo. Okay, okay. You might see a toned down version of it. I, I, I but I, I did write it because I just the ridiculousness of it sort of. Um, you should I mean, just send us a copy of the toned down version of it. Okay. We can use that as the poster. There you go. There you go. There you go. Um, uh, any more questions? Any, please, uh, hey, Yatraj, yes, Yatraj, this is John Ward. Hi, Deanna, thanks for, Hi, for being here today. So, uh, as Natraj knows well, since we both visited, visited Calcutta, I, I was a U.S. diplomat at the U.S. consulate in Calcutta for three years and, and had responsibility for commercial, U.S. commercial operations in Bangladesh. So, I've visited Dhaka several times. And you know, I'm, I was always inspired by what Muhammad Yunus uh, could do, but sort of in the in the vein of the discussion about the political implications of uh, address, you know, uh, um, dealing with bias. Uh, I, I guess, Deanna, I just would be interested in your comments on you know the fact that Muhammad, Muhammad Yunus was pushed out of Grameen in 2011 by the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. And he was just convicted in January of violating Bangladeshi labor laws. Yeah. So I didn't know about the Bangladeshi and labor laws. So that is news to me. But I did hear about him being um, pushed out and, you know, that there was a lot of political, um, uh, uh, what do you Intrigue. call Intrigue. Yeah. You know, uh, around him as a person. Um, and to be honest, like there was part of me that didn't, I, I rarely ever actually tell somebody else's story. I rarely use, I, I, I normally use my own story, but part of the reason why I wanted to do this, it wasn't so much as a, um, I, uh, as in an homage to Muhammad and himself, but it was into the way that he was thinking. Because, you know, we can look at all kinds of different people that we put up in leadership positions, and we can always find a way to say, and, and I don't know enough about the story. I don't know. I'm not making any claims on either on either side. I did no investigation of this and didn't even know that that happened in January. So thank you for telling me. Um, but that's not the point, right? The point is, is like in the thinking process. And I think that this example is one of those ones that you could go and you could look at. Um, you could look at one of our social media giants, right? You could look at uh, the iPhone. You could look at you could look at all these different places, any place that there's been a disruption, and you can find these similar patterns. It was how am I thinking about who's not being included? How am I thinking about where I'm actually putting these tables and who can access them? And how am I thinking about what it looks like and how I'm behaving at the table? I mean, you know, I was going to use the example of Lyft. 
I, for years, I judged these uh, social enterprise contests and everybody was like, we should have a, I mean, every year I'd have like two or three people who would present trying to, you know, we should have a ride sharing program. Why did, why did it work? Because it was looking at, wait, we have this need. We have this different group of people who could actually provide the need than the way that we might've been thinking about it traditionally. And we're going to marry those two together. Right. So we're going to use these cars that and people who could drive them and we're going to use people who need rides. And they, they just they dismantled the way that we think about how we get around. Maybe it wasn't Lyft. Maybe it was who came first. I don't know. Who came first. Well, U- Uber's bigger. Right. Uber. Yeah. Uber came Uber. first. Right. But, but Lyft is first. out there, too. I, 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 the reason I mentioned Eunice and his problems is, I mean, it, it, when 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 Don was talking about, OK, not being. You're too disruptive, or I don't know if there's sometimes the danger of overreach, or that that you've got to be careful. And and what Yunus did was he he briefly formed a political party, mm. and Sheikh Hussein saw that as a direct threat, and that was yeah. the end of any kind of positive relationship there. So yeah, yeah. And I do think right, like, and and I I'm going to give you one other example, um, of thing that thing that I share, and I think this is a really helpful thing when you're talking about what DEI is and what it is not. So one of the things that I tell people all the time is that social justice, social justice is this circle. DEI is this other circle. And I'm sorry, I can't draw them for you, right? The two of them cross over for sure. I heavily depend on the people who are doing social justice work because they are influencing the way that companies and the way that organizations are responding to some of these issues. At the same time, when you think about what happens inside of an organization, what's unique about business is that we spend a majority of our time actually at the organizations that we work for, right? Or that we volunteer for, or that we support. We also know that those are places that have incredible, they're incredible economic engines. So when you think about the fact that these two things overlap, it's really important because what's happening there is going to influence what's going on in social justice and how we're able to like inform what's happening in the social justice space. But they are two separate things. They interlock, they overlap, but they're separate. And I'm going to give you the way that I try and tell people. It's like a way to help it stay stuck. If there is something going on and it is a social justice issue, it would be highly reasonable for me to make a picket sign, to go write my legislators, to write, to to make a, a public demonstration of my disappointment or how I feel or my opinion about it. If I have a problem with the person who is sitting in the cubicle next to me, those are not the same techniques that I could use, right? If I feel like I'm being marginalized or looked over, I get, holding a picket sign, I mean, okay, but I feel like if I'm just holding a picket sign over their cubicle, it'd be a little bit ridiculous. Not the same techniques because it's not the same environment. And so what we're trying to teach people and help them understand is that the two overlap, but they're not the same. We're talking about inclusion. We're talking about leadership. We're talking about how you show up for your people in a better way to really allow for them to thrive. We're talking about social justice. We're talking about policy and law and some of these other, and sometimes those things have to overlap and sometimes it's not appropriate. And I think understanding that distinction and being able to see where those things are and where they fit in uh, is really important. So again, I can't speak specifically to this instance, but what I can speak to is understanding that difference and how that's a really powerful thing. Because sometimes I have companies and leaders who want to get into conversations about things they know nothing about, right? Things that are deeply rooted in history or that are de- that are, have nothing to do with the mission of their organizations or how they need to show up, but they get involved because they, they don't know how to make that distinction between the two. And so whenever we have our DEI emergencies or, you know, like the, the signal goes up, like, ah! you can almost all the time trace it back to that, not knowing the distinction between the two. It's different for different organizations, right? If you're a political organization, your social justice line, those two things that might be like overlap like this. You're a bank, and, hmm. you're a technology, hmm. you're, hmm. maybe not as, maybe not the same. Thanks for telling me. <laughs> um, great. All right. So we are actually at a time where I, I need to pass the, the microphone over. Over, but I really appreciate these questions. Now, I know that if you're anything like me, uh, you're the type of person who's like, okay, she went too fast. And I wanted to spend some more time thinking about this and I wanted to do this. So what I did specifically for you is I actually created a gift. Um, if you take your phones out, you can actually get this and I'll make sure that the team uh, sends us out maybe in an email afterwards too. But this is actually a list of questions 
that allow for you to go deeper um, in these questions, in these big areas. So there's just much more questions, much more reflection. So it's a good one to be able to share with yourself, but it's also a really good one if you wanted to share it with like your team or maybe your club. Um, it's a good conversation starter. So I wanted to make sure that you all had that. And again, we'll make sure that the organizers can send that out to all of you who registered. Uh, is it okay for me to move to the next slide? Well, Deanna, uh, oh. one of the things that we talked about beforehand is they changed the interface. And when you came back from the, the breakout room, oh. your screen sharing disappeared. So. Oh, my. Okay, give me one second here. That's You're not going to be able to do that if you can't see the screen. Uh, for some reason, it keeps disappearing. Let's see. Okay, here we go. How about? that is that better it's coming <laughs> up yep there it is yep. we have the okay code. thank you so much don thank you so much for letting me know um but yes this is a gift and if you can use it uh you know and use it however you want to we we would be delighted to to know that you were sharing it and that you were using it as an opportunity for additional reflection and so it takes those three questions and really does a much deeper dive with all of them all right everybody got it and if you don't we'll make sure that the link gets sent out later on too but I also, want to let you, oh. so, okay. I also wanted to let you know that if you're also like me, all your best questions come at two o'clock in the morning. So I cannot respond at two o'clock in the morning. But if you are one of those people and you're like, oh, I want to ask this question, or maybe I've thought about it this way, I would just encourage you to reach out to me um, on LinkedIn. I am a LinkedIn influencer, so I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. We love being able to engage people and create community. I also love being able to give out free stuff. So if you connect on LinkedIn, it'll just give you the opportunity to be able to see that. But also, if there is one of those burning questions that you have, I'd be happy to try uh, my best to be able to respond to it. All right. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I think I am passing it back over. Uh, to Don. Thank you, Deanna. And it was really a delight and pleasure to actually meet you in person, um, so to speak. And you know, um, for me, a lot of this, looking at the biases, uh, my own personal journey, I used, you know, when I was, I was 54 years old, and I didn't think I was I had any biases until I learned about the framing bias and the cognitive bias. And, and for me, one of the parts of the journey was really looking more and more at the language that I use. And for me, one of the things about always and never. And as mm. soon as I see, hear those coming out of my word, it's like, whoop, there's one of my biases leaking out. And it gives me a chance to, to work around. So thank you for facilitating this conversation and helping us move forward. Um, <clears throat> with that, I do want to uh, invite uh, our chair, um, past district governor, Angie Brester to close us out. Yes, um, I really wanna thank Deanna for her continued advocacy and sharing of knowledge and really being here and present and getting us engaged today. Um, I think a lot of people realize that this is being recorded, and I think we'll see a lot of engagement through that recording, so thank you. I also want to thank our district DEI committee volunteers, because they continue to find ways to enhance and enrich all of our lives, and those people include our um, host or monitor today, um, Len Yaquinta, and then Natraj Shanker, who you've seen on screen as well. And the, the committee also includes Maria Flores, Diane Milner, Pete Bosch, and myself. Um, I hope you'll look for an evaluation coming in the next couple of days and give us your honest feedback because that's how we keep improving and doing what we're doing. I want you to note that on May 21st, it's a Tuesday night at six o'clock for an hour and a quarter. We will be focusing on how to become better advocates for and understanding dementia. It's going to lead us into June, which is a month dedicated to raising awareness about Alzheimer's disease and promoting brain health. And for those of you who struggle sometimes with, well, how do I help people who are just shut off to DEI? Help people by even seeing where they are included in the whole DEI conversation. And we feel like 
creating dementia friendly communities and awareness around dementia and Alzheimer's is kind of that softball of maybe helping people see, oh, I'm not excluded in this conversation. I'm included. And so uh, we will be focusing on dementia in May, and there'll be a play that's being done, Unforgettable. And Diane, you're, you're going to share that with everybody here, or we can also email that out. And we hope that clubs will also get engaged in the Alzheimer's walks in the fall. How many of you knew, just show hands, or those of you who know faces, um, how many of you did know that Alzheimer's Association and Rotary International are, are formal partners now? And we want to work together to create dementia-friendly communities. So uh, we hope you'll get engaged. And if you're the only person from your club, hopefully you'll, you can help take that message back that we want clubs to get engaged and to participate. I do want to just say, if you're not a Rotarian, please get curious. And if you've gotten any curiosity about Rotary, including Deanna, um, we, are a, a family of over 1.4 million people in over 220 countries. And I can tell you that as a member for the last 36 years, I'm just little Angie whose parents' mom is from Panama and the, the jungles of Panama and my dad uh, from Germany. And I grew up in Sterling, Illinois. And if it were not for Rotary, I could not have had as big of an impact on change in this world with polio vaccinations, with social change, with microloans, with water. I would never have had those opportunities were it not for Rotary. And there's a place for everybody in Rotary and every club is different. Uh, you can even be in clubs that you don't have to ever meet in person, you do it virtually. But I would invite you to see where Rotary fits in your world. And if you're a Rotarian that's you know, maybe just kind of attending meetings, find ways to be more engaged. I just think Rotary helps us be a part of the bigger family, make change in our communities, in our work, in our schools, it, within the clubs, within our neighborhoods. And I have this crazy belief that if we can really begin to understand, and especially people in international settings or down the street, maybe we really can have peace in this world. And that is what Rotary's intentions are about. Some of you have heard that Jennifer Jones, our past district, our past Rotary International president, she used to say, DEI is built into the DNA of Rotary. And she talked about how back in the 40s, Paul Harris brought together all the different religious groups in one meeting in Chicago. Now that in its time was diversity. It's been a part of Rotary from the beginning. So I just ask you, Help us fulfill our mission that together we see a world where people unite, we take action to create lasting change across this globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. And thank you for joining us today.